I'll start by telling the dreadful C-3PO story, which is a true story, and it does have some impact on what I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, about, um, in 1996, uh, something very marvellous happened in my life, and um, they, they re-digitised and redid all the original Star Wars trilogy and released them at the cinema. And at the time, my, my eldest son was about five at the time, and um, Walker's Chris did these things called Tazos, which I don't know if anybody remembers. They were like little cardboard discs that you'd get inside the crisp packets, and you could collect them up. And so we ate nothing but Walker's Crisps for about three months. And then they had, if you got the whole set, there were six very special ones that were orange in colour. And you had to get these from Doritos. You couldn't get them out of the normal Walker's Crisps. So we ate loads and loads of Doritos to the point that my son turned slightly orange at one point. And so we collected all these together, we had the whole set. Now, if you collected the whole set, you could send off, if you were particularly sad and nerdy, for the binder. So we sent off for the uh, Walker's Tazos binder, and we, got it, we put them all in, and we were delighted. And in the back of the binder, it's, as if this couldn't get any more exciting, there was a Star Wars quiz, so there was 20 questions. So I sat down and thought, right, this is my domain now. I'm gonna, and I, got, I went through, I went through them all, but question 14, I'll always remember, it said... Um, which actor who played C-3PO was also the lead singer in Shalimar, the uh, disco outfit from the 80s and 90s, who had hit, hits such as Night to Remember. And it said, uh, and I thought, well, that's Anthony Daniels, isn't it, played C-3PO? And it said, Anthony, I thought, I never knew that. I thought, well, I'm going to remember that. But well, one day, that's going to come up in a pub quiz, and I'm going to look like some sort of genius. <laughs> So anyway, fast forward 15 years, uh, about four years ago, every year I go away with my friends, we have a sort of lads weekend away, um, and we, we always go somewhere sort of exotic, and we tie it in with a sporting event, such as the World Cup or whatever. So four years ago, it was the Rugby World Cup, so uh, we went to Tenby in Wales. <laughs> um, if anybody hasn't been there, it's the Las Vegas of Wales, is the way that we, uh, we built Tenby. So we sat in Tenby in this pub, and for some reason, Professor Brian Cox came up as part of the discussion. And somebody said, do you know he used to be in a band called d -Ream? And everybody went, yeah. And at that point, something at the back of my mind went, C-3PO, shout out. And I said, okay. I said, right, this is gonna this is gonna knock you dead. Did you know that the bloke that played C3PO, at this point the pub's gone completely quiet, uh, was the lead singer of Shalimar? And everybody just slowly turned around to me, and as these words had come out, I just thought, that's not true, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd never really thought about it. I'd never given it, I just thought that's such a brilliant fact. And then somebody said, there was silence for about five seconds, and one of my mates went, Shalimar? I said, yeah. He said, no, no, the leader of the channel, they call him Jeff Daniel. He's not even got the same name. He's not even got the same surname. He's Anthony Daniels. Right, Anthony Daniels is uh, a white, tall, skinny, British dancer. Jeff Daniel is a small, American, black singer. Okay, so you can't get two more diametrically different people than these two people. And I'd spent 15 years believing this because I'd never thought to question it ever. And so one of the things that I'm going to be talking about when we get to the main presentation <laughs> is uh, just believing stuff and uh, just accepting things. Just because it's written down, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but there is a selection of my books downstairs. <laughs> So, hello, uh, my name is John Holt. I'm here as part of the Model Based Systems Engineering Working Group uh, as part of Encosa UK to give a presentation on the bene benefits and challenges of MBSC. Uh, subtitle I know an old lady. Okay. Um, I'm currently the technical director of Encosa UK, um, but as I said, today I'm here as part of the MBSC Working Group. Um, the success of this as a presentation relies on the fact that you're familiar with the old nursery rhyme, I know an old lady who can swallow the fly. Uh, should you ever think of using this as an example in your presentations, and you go to Holland, for example, to give, I don't know, let's say, a keynote at an Incozy International Conference, uh, like I did a couple of years ago, the weird thing is, everybody in Holland has heard about and knows about Star Wars Tazos, nobody in Holland has heard about the old lady who swallowed the fly. But that's just one of life's little uh, inconsistencies there. Um, so really what, I, what I'm going to talk about today is MBSE and why we do it. And actually, how do you, how do you make a case for doing MBSE? How do you make a case for the benefits of MBSE? Um, uh, how can you articulate, articulate this to people? And we're going to do this through the medium of uh, the, the strange old nursery rhyme. So first of all, our first sort of diagram of the day 
is MBSE and if you like the MBSE mantra is to do MBSE successfully we need people, we need processes and we need tools. And when I say people, we mean, we mean competent people. People with the right skills to do the job, to fulfil their role, not just bums on the seats. When I talk about process there, I'm talking about process uh, as the bigger picture. So I'm actually talking about the whole approach. So the processes, the, uh, the frameworks, uh, the ontologies and so on and so on. And when I talk about tools there, I'm not just talking about case tools, so you know, SysML, MBSE case tools. I'm also talking about things like notations. So things like uh, different languages, uh, SysML, UML, uh, Modelica, all these kinds of things. Um, and it's really this combination of all three that we need to get right. We need to make sure we address all three of these, these, different, uh, these different areas. And if we do one of them and not the others, then it can lead to problems. We can have the best people in the world. We can have the uh, you know, most brilliant people in the world. Um, and the best tools, but if there's no underlying process to get these people to work together, then actually it's going to be a waste of time. Because we've got these lines between them, we've got these relationships between them. And the, the people, the competencies of those people, should enable the approach, they should enable the process. So these lines are essential. And this line here, our approach, the way that we do things, must drive the tool and not the other way around. All too often we see people changing the way that they work, changing their working practices because they bought into a particular tool set. Tools by their very definition are there to help us to make our job more efficient and more effective and we've got to make sure that we drive these things all the time. So that's kind of, uh, you know, how do we realise NBSE, how, how do we achieve it? But that's only half of the battle because in order to do this properly, we've got to act, people will say, well why should I be doing this, you know, what are the benefits, what's the business case for it, if you like. And this is where we're going to come into um, uh, the nursery rhyme. Um, now, this relies on the old story of the old lady who swallowed a fly. Okay? Now, the analogy here is the old lady who swallowed a fly is like the organisation that wants to adopt MBSE. Okay? Does anyone know why she swallowed a fly? No, because we don't know why she swallowed a fly. That's the nursery rhyme. Okay? I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Why do you want to do MBSE in the first place? That's the question that you've got to ask people. Uh, why is it that when we talk about systems engineering, the idea of uh, just build it, developing a project and building a project up without thinking about the need, without doing a requirements analysis beforehand, is ludicrous in the world of systems engineering. Yet, businesses all the time say, let's adopt something that's as crucial as the way that we work, MBSE, but let's not think about why in the first place. It just doesn't make any sense. So one of the very important things to think of is why. Um, do you know why you want MBSE? Do we know why she swallowed the fly? And it's going to depend on context, it's going to depend on the point of view, it's going to depend on the role that we're playing, because different stakeholders that we, that we talk to will have different needs, they'll, they'll look to get different types of benefits. Um, so talking of benefits then, this is the, the diagram we saw earlier, the MBSE, the realisation of MBSE, our, our mantra. And really, the reason that we're doing this is because we've got different stakeholders and they've got to realise benefits. They've got to re realise a number of benefits. And we're going to realise these via MBSE. So this is what this diagram is telling us. But we need to know what those benefits are going to be and what these roles are going to be, what these stakeholder roles are going to be. So if we look at some of the typical roles that we might have uh, when we're adopting some sort of MBSE initiative. This part of the diagram is exactly the same as the previous diagram. Okay, all I've done is I've expanded the, the stakeholder. We've got three main roles that are identified here based on the ISO standards, the ISO, ISO definitions. We've got supplier roles, we've got external roles, we've got customer roles. Supplier roles are generally us, that's generally the, the uh, developing organisation. So uh, managers, engineers, uh, some sort of sponsor of the MBSE work. Um, these other two categories, customer and external, they're really the, the, the roles of who we're trying to keep happy. Okay, these are the people we're trying to keep happy and we, we want to make sure that we can uh, meet their requirements if you like. The main difference between these two is with a customer we can generally reason with them in some way and uh, achieve some sort of compromise, strike some sort of happy medium. With an external it's a lot more difficult. So this is where things like standards, legislation, legislation and, uh, and so on go in. On the customer side we've got the end users, we've got the operators and we've actually got the person paying for that system as well. So we just call them the system sponsor. But what is very important to understand is that each one of these roles will actually look for adopting MBSE for different reasons. Okay? So taking our sort of classic MBSE approach, we've got some stakeholder roles here. Let's look at their points of view, let's look at their context, let's look at the context of an engineer to begin with. 
So I've, we've just got the simple use case diagram here. It doesn't really matter too much about what it says. But from an engineering point of view, um, and I'll just say a word about where these have come from. And when, when I do pieces of work with companies or training courses or whatever, very often we have this discussion towards the end. I'll say to people quite deliberately, what do you think the benefits are from your point of view? And I'll secretly write them all down and I'll secretly produce models that they know nothing about. So this is just a sort of generic one based on sort of my experience and some of the people I've been working with. And uh, if you talk to engineers and say, you know, from your point of view, from an engineering context, what, why are you doing MBSE? You know, why did you swallow the flight? And they'll say things like, well, to improve system development. Okay. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, actually, you know, I want to manage complexity. I want to increase understanding. I want to improve communication. And that, that's what I mean by it. And it's going to include things like improving consistency, improving automation, making the whole approach more efficient. Uh, automation in terms of testing, uh, artifact generation, model check. All these things that are laborious and take time to, we need to, you know, that involve other stakeholders as well, then this is where the tool should come and help us. This is where MBSE should help us. And also to improve tool interoperability. You know, the idea of just adopting a single tool set for most organisations in the world is, is, is simply not true. There's going to be a variety of tool sets that we need to work together. Uh, so this is where this is coming from. This is just saying, well, if you talk to engineers, this is the kind of response that, uh, that you'll get. And it's certainly the kind of response that I've been getting over the last three or four years when I've been asking these questions. Okay. Um, Let's talk to somebody else on the stakeholder uh, diagram there. Let, let's talk to the, the MBSE sponsor. So now let's go to the person in your organisation that's going to be putting up, putting up the money for implementing the people, process and tools. What do they want? Well, actually, they want something completely different. Okay? What they want to do is increase the value of the business. They want to increase sales and they want to increase quality. Okay? And again, these are just based on the, uh, uh, the responses that I've had. Uh, they want to invest in MBSE, this is going to be the big constraint, this is how we're going to do this. And actually, very importantly, if they're going to invest in MBSE, there's a massive constraint on that, which is to demonstrate, um, to demonstrate the return on investment, to demonstrate the ROI. And unless you can do that um, to, to this level of person, then it's a waste of time. There's no point going to the sponsor and saying, oh, it's great because it means I can uh, generate documents automatically and I can improve consistently. So what? From their point of view, they probably don't care. Okay? Now you have to bear in mind, as I said, these are generic ones, so this will be different depending on your organisation, depending on where you're coming from. Um, but it's a very useful, a very powerful exercise to do to look at this. So once I've done this, I said, well actually, what are the benefits of MBSE? Can we identify what these benefits are? Now if you talk to most uh, tool vendors, for example, uh, sorry, I just had to get a nasty taste out of my mouth. Um, I don't know what that is. If you talk to most tool vendors, it's no good. <laughs> and they'll list, you know, these are the benefits of MBSE, better consistency, better, and that's all perfectly well and valid, but actually you've got to say, well, there's other benefits as well. So all we've got on this slide is then, is just, we've identified a number of different benefits, and we've got things like uh, communication, uh, reuse, uh, tool interoperability, automation, efficiency, consistency, complexity management, all these things that excite us as systems engineers. But there's also other benefits as well, such as time, resources, uh, money, uh, different quality attributes. So what about safety? What about security? What about compliance with standards and these sorts of things? And ultimately, what about the return on investment? So we identified these and we said, well, actually, these dotted lines, can we think of any dependencies between them? And so we drew up these dependency relationships. And again, this will differ depending on your organisation and the way that you work and the, the area that you work in. Um, but we said, well, actually, if you want to sell to somebody, your MBSE sponsor, this is the sort of stuff they're going to be interested in, the stuff on the left. Okay? If you want to sell to your managers, it's probably this stuff in the middle that's going to get them excited, the, the time, resources, and money. If you want to sell to engineers, it's this stuff that's going to get, uh, be exciting. But we know, as model-based systems engineers, that this is what we can achieve. What it's important for us to be able to demonstrate is actually this path over to return on investment. So when we say, well, actually, MBSE will help you return on investment, why? Because we can show it will improve quality. So, for example, safety and security. Well, how is it going to do that? Because we can improve consistency, we can manage complexity, and so on. And we can automate things. That's going to improve. So this is where one way we've come up with is just saying, well, actually, you know, what are the benefits? Very importantly, what are the dependencies between them? Because depending who we talk to, they're going to be interested in a different area on this. And it's the relationships between these that are very important. Because it, if somebody says, well, actually, okay, reuse, so what? Well, actually, no, reuse is important. It's going to improve our efficiency. 
we can improve efficiency, it's going to have an impact on time, resource, money, and all of these things are going to lead to a return on investment. Okay? Now, this isn't carved in stone, as I say, this is just based on, uh, on my own experiences and so on, but it, it's proven to be quite a useful uh, way to sort of articulate uh, you know, what are some of the benefits to people. Ideally, what we'd want to do as well is to tie in concrete examples to these different ones as well. Well, actually, can you demonstrate to me that, you know, we can put numbers more easily on the stuff on the right-hand side than we can to this kind of stuff, okay? But we can probably do something clever aggregating these numbers up to demonstrate that we can improve these. So, that's, you know, so we need to think about why. Why did we swallow the fly in the first place? Um, if you don't know why you want MBSE, if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, then how on earth do you know how to tackle MBSE, what to do about it? So we've got the problem of the fly. How do you solve a problem with flies? Obviously, you get a spider and you swallow the spider. And the spider wriggles and wriggles about inside her. Um, because a spider is a tried and tested solution for flies. But if you're not sure why you swallowed the fly in the first place, don't go swallowing more small uh, animals. Um, so for flies, this is a spider. For MBSE, this is of standards, architectural frameworks, notations, processes, methodologies. Let's just throw more stuff at the problem. Yeah, but what is your problem that you're trying to achieve in the first place? Just because somebody adopted an architectural framework, uh, we'll call it F for now, for good reason, um, and it worked for them, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. Okay? It might have to be tailored for you. It might be completely inappropriate. There are lots of architectural frameworks, for example, out there. Um, how do we know which one's going to be relevant for you that you're going to get the value from, you're going to get the benefits from? The same with processes. I work with different industries all the time, and there's this kind of cycle of industries that say, you know, industry, one industry will say, oh, this industry's been doing it, we should look for them and do it the same way that they do it. And then you talk to that industry, and they're looking to somebody else and seeing how they did it. And you end up almost in this loop of people looking towards other people. So let's just adopt the way that they've done it, and it's, you know, it's bound to work for us, but it, it might not do. It, it might work for you, but it might not. So it's very important that we understand why we want to do it in the first place and we look very realistically at what these things are, what these solutions are, and are they going to work for us and are we going to get some of these benefits. So let's take architectural frameworks as the example. Okay, if you talk about architectural frameworks, there are, there are many, many architectural frameworks. There's the whole uh, defence-based ones, the MODAF, DODAFs, NAFs, and so on. There's the classic Zachman one, of course, it was one of the, uh, the original frameworks. There's now an ISO standard, 42010. System and, softwares and, and systems and software engineering architecture descriptions. Um, but what do you want your framework for? What are you trying to achieve? Because these frameworks all have a different purpose. They have different aims. Okay? For example, most of the defence ones are all about acquisition. Well, don't adopt that as part of your development things. That's not what it's for. Okay? Uh, so you need to understand, you know, what is it you're trying to do? Are you trying to do enterprise architecture, development, acquisition? Because some of these may or may not be appropriate for you, and they look quite different, some of them. Okay. Um, this one on the, the top left, that's the, the sort of defence-based ones, the MODAFs, DODAFs, and so on. This one on the top right, that's what Zachman looks like, and all we've done here, we've just modelled these, uh, these different approaches. And this one at the bottom, that's what the ISO standard says that architectures and architecture frameworks are all about. Okay. So they can look quite differently, but what we are able to do by using something like MBSE is to represent these things and assess them, evaluate them, compare them with one another, where are they strong, where are they weak, and actually tailor them as well. We can take the, uh, the concepts, we can tailor them, we can rearrange the relationships and so on, but the main point here is about going in with your eyes open and actually saying, no, is this going to be the solution to me? Is it going to work for me? Okay. Um, we might have picked our architecture, but now how on earth do we start to uh, take the next step? So. Obviously, if you've got a spider, the next thing to do is to swallow a bird, and then a cat, and then a dog, because obviously dogs eat cats. Um, <laughs> how absurd, she swallowed a bird. Uh, imagine that, she swallowed a cat. Uh, what a hog is the one I had to look up. Uh, she swallowed a dog. So then people say, okay, well, in order to do this, we've got our framework in place or whatever that we've uh, adopted. Uh, let's speak a common language. So this is, this is the classic one. Well, what do you do if you want to speak a common language? Well, let's all just speak SysML and there will be no other problems that we'll have in the world. Now, I'm personally a big advocate of SysML, but when you talk about the common language, the thing you need to understand is that there are two aspects. Uh, there's the spoken language and there's the domain language. So, for example, if you said, well, as long as we all speak English in this room, uh, we're never going to have any communication problems. That's clearly nonsense, because it depends on your background, it depends on the area that you work in, it depends on your experiences. And when we talk about MBSE, 
the need for the language is the same. We need both. So when we talk about CSML, CSML represents the spoken language. That's just like saying let's speak English. It doesn't mean we're all going to be able to communicate brilliantly. It means we'll have a mechanism that will give us the potential to communicate very efficiently. But what we're missing is this domain-specific language. Okay? We need to capture our domain. We need to capture this domain knowledge that gives us the, the, the technical content, if you like, of the language. So we always need to have both. We need to have a, a, a spoken language, CISML, UML, whatever the notation is going to be. And we need to have the domain-specific language. And one of the ways that we can capture this is through using something like CISML or, or a, a, a spoken language and create something like an ontology. So in terms of a spoken language, this is what CISML looks like. There's a number of different diagrams that allow us to visualise different aspects of our system. When we talk about an ontology, this is an example of an MBSE ontology that, that, uh, that, that we use, that we've developed as part of the books. So there's a lot of information there, but there's key points. Let's focus on one part of this. Let's look at the, the architecture one. So this is a blow-up of the main concepts and terminology that we use in the world of architecture. What I'm now able to do with this diagram, remember the one we had a few slides back with the different architectural frameworks and so on, I can draw lines between these back to those original ones, and all of a sudden I've got the start point for traceability and compliance to my standards. But this time based on my own understanding, my own domain knowledge, my own ontology that relates to architecture. Okay. And I can do the same thing in any other area. I can look at needs or requirements or whatever. Okay. I can do this, I can look at what all the best practice models say, I can look at the way I want to work, and I can abstract the common view from this, the common ontology from this. And it, again, it gives me the traceability, it gives me automatic training material, it gives me the basis for some of my competency statements as well. So the ontology is a very, very powerful concept, and one of the things that it gives us is this idea of a domain-specific language. Okay. So we've got our domain-specific language in. Um, what else do we do with it? We've, we've chosen a framework, we've got our ontology in place, we're going to use SysML. How do we now realise this? What do we do with this? How do we visualise our framework? Well, we've got this problem at hand. The best way to get rid of birds, cats and dogs is clearly to uh, get goats involved. To be fair, goats will eat anything. Cows are herbivores. So, probably not the best solution for getting rid of your goats. And uh, she opened her throat, rhymes with goats, and I don't know how she swallowed a cow. So now we're in complete chaos, okay? We don't know what the original goal was, if we don't know why we're doing it, that means we can't make a good choice on some of the solutions that are out there, the, the, the standards, the frameworks, and so on. Um, we haven't got the common, it, it's absolute chaos, okay? So we need to have these mechanisms in place. We mentioned the MBSE ontology, the one that we just spoke about. How else can we use that? Well, actually, if we've got a good ontology in place, and we've got a framework in place, we can actually tie the two together and we can make sure that each of the views in our frameworks, this is an example of what a view might look like, it focuses on a different part of our ontology. It allows me now to say, well actually the complete set of views in my framework should cover the whole of the ontology. There should be these little blue blobs all over that diagram and they should cover every aspect on there. If there's something that isn't covered, it either means we're missing a view or maybe it shouldn't be there, maybe it's not important. If we find there's something that does exist on a view that isn't on the ontology, we ask ourselves the same, same question. Are we missing something from the ontology? Um, have we got something in a view that nobody wants, that nobody needs? It's very easy to generate views in an architecture. It's not quite so easy to make them of value, to make them uh, have some sort of added value and be of interest to people. So here's an example of another one. So this is the one that we're using a context type view there. And this is what it might look like. Okay. So it's bringing all of these things together in, uh, in, in a good, consistent fashion. But key to all of this is understanding why in the first place. If you're about to adopt MBSC or you're considering adopting MBSC, you should treat it like any other systems engineering project. You need to know why you're doing it in the first place. What are our objectives? What are we trying to achieve? How are we going to measure the success? What does the success look like when we start to adopt these things? If you don't do that, you just start buying more and more tools more and more frameworks, more and more consultancy or whatever, not knowing why you did it in the first place, and you end up swallowing the horse. And just like the old lady who swallowed the horse, if you adopt MBSE badly, you'll be dead, of course. Okay. So just to wrap up the presentation then, when we talk about MBSE, we talk about people, process and tools. But it's not just a case of buying tools, training people, and adopting a standard process. Okay? We've got to understand why we're doing it and what the benefits are. We don't apply these techniques blindly. 
um, like I said, whether they're people, processes or tools. And it's getting it right includes having a solid basis for MBSE, having that concrete foundation there, using things like ontologies. If you get it wrong, you can, be, you can do more harm than good. And if you get it wrong, you will look around and before you know it, your room will be full of dead bodies and holes. Okay. Thanks very much for listening. That concludes the presentation. Um, if people have any questions associated with the presentation, uh, there will be a link up that will take you to a discussion uh, forum, I think, that will be on LinkedIn. Also, the slides for this presentation are available. Uh, please get involved with the MBSC Working Group, with it, within COSI on a, on a wider level, and in particular in COSI UK. And any questions that you have, any, uh, anything, your observations or any points you want to make, uh, please address towards the MBSC Working Group. There will be a link at the bottom of the page uh, after this presentation. I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'd like to thank Incozy UK for giving me the opportunity to speak to you and as I said I look forward to hearing from people in the future. Thank you.